uh, it's our false historical society. It is uh, March of 2010, and our guest today is Jenny Stevens. And can you tell me where you were born at? I was born in a, what they call the Piney Woods of East Texas, and it was six miles from uh, Mount Vernon, Texas, and six miles from Winsboro, Texas. A little community called Cypress. I was and born at home. You know, we weren't used to going to hospitals okay. being so, five miles or six miles from town. Yeah. And so I was born at home. And then when I was four years old, I can remember my mother taking me to uh, one of the towns six miles from where I was born. And our I went to uh, see the soldiers who were getting off of the train coming from World War I. Okay. And that's my first experience of seeing a man in uniform. And, and I do remember seeing the men get off of the train. Also, it was my first time to go in where they had uh, facilities <laughs> indoors instead of having outdoor toilets. They farmed, but in East Texas at that time, farms were no bigger, bigger than, than a big lot in a, in a city uh, or an estate. It, there, there were just little cotton patches, we called them, and we raised cotton. And if we raised three and could harvest three bales, that was our, our financial income. Otherwise, we raised everything that we ate in our gardens. We had uh, good gardens and chickens and and a hog to kill for uh, our food. And uh, um, and we did all of our laundry outside. I had a nephew call me this past year and said, Aunt Jenny, what did you do that you didn't have to have, you didn't have any heat in your house, you didn't have any furnaces, so what, how did you keep warm? It, he couldn't figure out what, the, what kind of, and we had a fireplace, and then we had a little cook, kitchen cook stove, and we had uh, wells outside, we, we draw water, we called it when to get buckets out of the uh, of water out of the wells. We drew the water up, meaning we pulled the ropes up to get the water up from wells. And we didn't have pumps even in my early years. There were six of us in our family originally. Uh, I, before I was born, there was a, a child who was under five years old and she was playing in front of the fireplace and my dad was outside and my mother was down at the church at a meeting and she came running out the door, her clothes were on fire. She, had, she wore little long dresses as they did in those days. That was 1911 and she uh, was burned to death or burned until she, I mean, Savage died. So I, that was before my time, but there were six, I had five siblings then. In the Never house. had running water. We had, as I say, we got it from our wells. We had uh, water in buckets that we drank out of, and we had a dipper. And that's the way, way we'd get thirsty. We'd come in and take that dipper and get a dipper of water and drink it and put the dipper right back in the bucket <laughs> and everybody would do the same thing. I didn't get to start school until I was seven because we lived uh, a little over a mile from the school that I could go to. And because I was just little and I had older siblings who went to school because they could walk and they did walk to school, uh, and uh, but I couldn't go because I was too little and my folks had no way to take me, so no car, no vehicle, I, 
we had uh, horses, but for for farm horses, but uh, I couldn't ride a horse to school, being under age seven. But I didn't get to start school till I was seven. We did move then into town, uh, where or at the edge of town where I could walk to school, and I started at seven years old in April, and I started in September. So I was very late starting to school, in accordance to the kids that start school this day and age. Well, I gathered eggs. I, um, we swept a yard. My mother would take branches from trees and tie them up, and you would take those and sweep the, the, well, the sand lands, or uh, sand yards that we had. We didn't have yards like we do today. Just the, the little weeds that grew close to the ground. But we would sweep it up to make it all look nice and clean. And then uh, I'd have to do washing. And we, that, we washed on scrub boards then. We didn't have any, any modern uh, washing. Three three tubs sitting on a bench, one for soap and water and uh, for scrubbing on the rub board, one for rinsing uh, the soap out, and one for, another one for rinsing more soap out, and they always put what they call bluing in that water. And I could never, and it was blue, it was a drops of blue that you dripped in the rinse water, and that was supposed to really take the soap out and make your clothes whiter. And then we had to hang all the clothes on the lines outside because we didn't have any dryers. And so those kind of the kind of things, chores that I did. Gathering eggs was one of my fun things to do. Uh, I even, we had guineas and they are a bird that loved to hide nest out in the woodies areas around our place. So I would go out and hunt the guinea nest and bring home the eggs that the guineas would lay. And and I thought I wanted to eat them and my mother would tell me they weren't very good. We just had let guineas hatch eggs so that we could have little guineas running around because they're an interesting little bird. And uh, I, But I really mm -hmm. love to do that. and. Then another thing I did that certainly no one in this part of the country would know about, we grew some peanuts. And the soil, you grow peanuts, and it's kind of sandy soil. So to harvest those, you had to pull them up out of the ground and shake off the dirt, and then they were set, uh, we had poles set up, my dad did, and we put those uh, peanuts down on this pole and until it would be a three or four feet of peanuts, if you can just envision a, a plant and pulling it up out of the sand and have a lot of peanuts on it. Well, okay, this would then dry out the peanuts. And then we would take them in a, a house, or I mean a yard, and wherever we had place to store them, whether it be in the, uh, a uh, barn or whether it be in a uh, little shed, that type of thing to put the peanuts in. And I can remember going out and pulling the peanuts off of the vine and then shelling them and then coming in and we called, we had what we call parched peanuts. We, we put them in the oven and parched them. And those are the kind of things that, that was fun for me to do. and. Uh, and my mother always knew we should be stay busy. She could figure out things for us to do. We had to clean the outdoor toilets. That was another thing. We scrub the seats on the toilets and clean out the the debris from the things. And put we put lime down in the toilet holes. And then we'd have to clean it out and take it out, and put in the area past the house so that maybe in the field or in a, in a pasture. And I even had to learn to 
milk a cow. Uh, my brother was older and he usually did the milking, but he went to college and then I was the next in line, so I had to learn to milk a cow. I lived in 11 houses before I graduated from high school. We just moved from one area to another. Um, um, not, no, my sister and I were four years apart and we just played with each other and, uh, and we'd uh, go out in the yard and build us a, what we called um, a, a house and <laughs> that didn't have any roof or anything. We would draw squares and that would be a room and we'd go from <laughs> room to the other and um, we just would create our own, our own fun. And I didn't have any of these modern toys. <laughs> we, we just grew up that way. In uh, 1929, my dad had the family move, had us move to uh, Oklahoma. Now there again, it was still a rural living. And we lived five miles from where we went to school and we went on a bus. The bus picked me up and my brother. And uh, um, that was five miles into town, into the little town and the school district. Uh, and I went there until I graduated from high school. And then uh, Oklahoma, well, Texas had 11 grades, Oklahoma had 12. So I didn't graduate until I was 19 years old. I was 19 in April and graduated in May. There were 13 in our class the year I graduated. Um, not, not many. Uh, were you one of the first ones in your family to go graduate from high school? Oh no, no, my brother, my older sister did and she taught school. My older brother taught school and his, their wives or spouses did. Um, um, my, then my brother, just older than I, played, uh, he got a scholarship for basketball in a junior college in, where we lived in Oklahoma, and he uh, got spinal meningitis. Uh, six of the boys, uh, basketball players, got a couple of them died, and my brother lost his hearing with the disease, and it took him uh, at least six months to recover from that. And then he, as I said, he was left deaf, and so he didn't get to finish college, but he did uh, work during the war at a defense plant in San Antonio, and uh, uh, he was able to make, make himself a good living in spite of losing his, but of course he was disappointed because he had hoped that he could be a coach, go to college and then be a coach, but that didn't happen. But he, uh, he managed to make a good income for the family. And then, and now I'm the only sibling left on the arm of my uh, I, That summer, my older sister and my brother and their spouses, uh, insisted that I go to, they had gone to East Texas State Teachers College to get their degree, and in those days you could go, um, I went summer, winter and summer, got off enough courses to get a certificate to teach. So the year after, in the fall of my second year, I taught, and then I went back to school in the summertime and took, uh, took uh, uh, courses by correspondence. And until in 1940, I had taught two years and had off four years college from 36 to 40. You did what? Taught two years, two, oh. teaching two years. Okay. And had off my four years of college or for enough credit to go four years of college. Okay. Well, I remember um, we didn't have radios, but I had 
taught after I got my degree in, uh, from college in 40, the, the fall, I mean, the end of the summer in 40, uh, I taught that year and let me see now, you, that was 40, you said it was 41. Uh, you said you taught 1940. Yeah. And then in 41. Yes. Okay. Uh, another teacher who had a car and I went to what we called in the South, singings. They, this meant a group of people who loved to sing church songs. Uh, we'd go to the, a church who would be a singing at this particular church. So we went and when we got there, somebody who had had a radio let us know that this thing was going on in, in Hawaii and, uh, and the Japs had bombed it and all the, all the sad things that happened to our ships and the men and uh, the war. What uh, was your feelings at that time? Um, sadness first and then anger. Uh, after I had taught two more years, then I couldn't stand not to be part of it. And that's when I went to Fort Worth, Texas and got a job working for Consolidated Aircraft where they were building planes. And because and, I wanted to do something for the war effort. Well, I worked there for a year, nearly a year, and and then I still wasn't satisfied. And that's why I decided that when women begin to get into, into the war and the wax and the waves, and uh, I had to do that too. So that's how I came to join the service, and that was in 43. We were sent to what originally had been, been a compound for the Japs, the American Japs who were put in compounds at that time. Uh, as I think the history will tell you more about it than I can tell you now. Um, that what is, that's what happened to the Japs that, those years. But they hadn't put Japs in there yet, so they had us wax go there because the two places where the wax were being trained were full. That was uh, Fort Des Moines and Fort Oglethorpe, New J uh, Savannah, uh, Georgia, excuse me. And so they sent us there. This compound was built in an area that had been a field, a cotton patch. That's what the South calls these little farms, cotton patches or corn patches. And so that's where we, that's where we did our training. We did our marching in a cotton patch. You know, the ground was not leveled. <laughs> it was sandy soil. And uh, incidentally, there were some of the men trainers who were there to train the, the first uh, few weeks, a couple of weeks, were from, some of them were from Iowa. And it, I thought it was interesting that I, wouldn't it be interesting if I could run into somebody now who had trained us ladies in Western Louisiana in 1943 in April? But I don't know, I don't remember the towns they were from, of course. You know, being a Southern Texan, I didn't know that much about Iowa or what people did or that it was a famous corn state or not, not any of those things about Iowa. So, but I do remember that some of the guys were from Iowa. To, they shipped us by train to uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, to the gunnery school north of downtown Las Vegas. And now it's Nellis Air Base. And I was there from April to uh, just early in September. And then they needed physical therapist. And because I had had a major in physical education, I was picked as a person to go to, and they sent me to Stanford University.
to take a year's course in physical therapy. And then I was promoted. I went from a corporal to, uh, in the WAC to a second lieutenant in medical corps. We were supposed to associate with the enlisted people at that point. But of course, I had come up with enlisted people. And as in my training or in my early days of WAX, and so it it wasn't. <laughs> I I could still feel that it more comfortable with the um, and with the people who were not who didn't yeah. have bars. Uh, but so I got acquainted with Steve. He was a patient of mine, and uh, Steve became your husband. He became my okay. husband. I went from there then to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, to a burn. Now they didn't, um, the one in, in El Paso didn't have a name like burning or orthopedic or anything specific. It was just general patients we had learned to work on that gave us. For instance, I worked, I helped Steve recover from his ankle surgery when he broke his ankle, uh, um, treated him with, we didn't have all the modern things that you have today in, his, in the therapy departments either. We had uh, infrared heat, diathermy, um, lots of personal massage, lots of uh, um, help to, for walking, all those kind of things, but it was more physical than than machinery as they have a lot today. While I was there and working on a patient, a black man, uh, he, uh, Helen Keller, came in to in the uh, ward to visit with the people, and she had her her helper with her, and she came right up to the person that I was working on, and that was. I can still have that feeling today that I had when she was there. She was just absolutely phenomenal. She just, uh, she was just such a, the movie, if you saw it, you can kind of know what she was like. And uh, it was a memory of mine that still will stay with me till I'm gone. Uh, it was a big pleasure to see it. But I had a lot of those experiences, only in different ways. Bob Hope came to our uh, uh, entertain us in at Las Vegas, and uh, I have a, a card that he autographed for me, and his uh, Francis Langford was with him, and she has her name on that card, and I those kind of things made my service day is really very enjoyable. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my time in the service. I made the best of it and didn't get back home until, uh, until I got out. I, I'd never had a furlough and so I never did uh, get back to my family, to my mother's, until uh, I got out. People who needed to walk, uh, learned to walk again after, some of them were prisoners of war. They were malnutritioned until they were helpless. They, they uh, uh, would get diseases that they, that they had to be treated to recover from. Uh, I had one particular patient that, uh, at, when I was at Palm Springs, very likable man, young man, but he would laugh about the sand in Palm Springs. And he says, and he was a prisoner of war in the Pacific area. And he said, you know, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to invest my money in this sand, in a pile of this sand out here. Because someday this this place is going to be uh, going to be popular, 
and and I think about it today. <laughs> he was so right. I've often wondered if he spent his money like that. You know, those guys who were in prison over there racked up, and especially the officers, quite a bit of finances while they were as prisoners of war. They came home with a goodly amount of money. Not, you know, not the, considering the wealth of people today, but I, I can't quite describe how I want to, I want to describe it, that we were, were listeners. They'd want to, they did want to talk about their days. A, a lot of soldiers didn't want to talk about killings, but they would talk about their horrible things that happened to them in, uh, in prison. And so and we were good listeners. And even while we were working on them, massaging them or helping them walk or putting their uh, joints through the ranges of motion to get their, uh, their health back, we, we were good listeners. And, uh, and even with all the rest of the time, the ladies helped the guys who were leaving from the gunnery school, for instance, and were being shipped overseas, and they weren't, some of them weren't getting to go home, and and we would listen to them talk, and and uh, and and they liked that. They liked having female companionship before they left, and those things are things that made my my service days really worthwhile. Just, mm -hmm. Just because they needed to talk to somebody who would understand what they were talking about. Some of them would get very stiff joints. Uh, 